Hello, and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Uh, by the way, some loyal fans pointed out that I might be pronouncing guillotine wrong. Uh, but I did some research, and it sounds like Americans are very entitled to say the term guillotine. Uh, the, the, the term uh, guillotined, uh, I'm not even sure the French pronounce it that way based on research. But again, let the debate continue. There is, of course, no debate on the importance of energy in science, and although you usually see a lot more of this in physics class, chemistry really has its fair share of energy changes, too. So we're going to touch on some types of energy, use it as a tool for keeping track of units, and then we're going to hit heat, temperature, endo, and exothermic. That's a lot to cover if I want to keep under my promise of 10 minutes or less, so let's get started. Energy is that ability or capacity to do work. And so even when you're dealing with energy changes, like the uh, cat and mouse are talking about, um, we're dealing with energy. Work itself is a very specific term in physics, but again, feel free to do a little research on your own. We measure this in something called the joule. Um, the joule is nothing but kilograms times meter squared over second squared, which sounds like a mouthful, uh, but it's not so bad. And you want to make sure you memorize that. Commit that to memory because we have to make sure these units work out in math. If you just memorize the J, you don't realize what the J is made up of, and you'll run into problems. You'll end up putting the wrong units into your equations. There are many, many types of energy, and there are many ways to change energy into each other through the law of conservation of energy. Conservation is a super big deal in chemistry, and although we focus more on the conservation of matter or mass, um, energy is still conserved also, and we can use it to help figure stuff out. But all these things are example of energy changes. Like light bulbs, for instance, take electrical energy, turn it into light and heat energy. Uh, less heat energy if you have something like an LED. That's why an LED light bulb can be a lower wattage because most of it's going to light, so you don't need as much wattage. Good to know. Wall is back. And there he goes. The creepy layer would be a great name for a band. So we're going to quickly touch on three types of energy. Potential energy is stored energy or energy by virtue of position. One type of that would be gravitational potential energy, which makes a great uh, example of units. Uh, mass acceleration due to gravity times height. The units for mass would be in kilograms. Acceleration is a rate of a rate, so it's meters per second squared, uh, which would be about 10 meters per second squared or 32 feet per second squared for you English fans, times meters. Um, now notice how that ends up being joules. So kilograms times meters squared per second squared. Huh? Kinetic energy is energy by virtue of motion. Uh, so the equation is one half mass velocity squared. Uh, sig fig fans, notice that is a fraction because that's an imaginary number. We didn't measure that one half against a scale, so it's not going to limit the significance of our answer. The units again are going to be kilograms times meters per second squared. So it's going to be kilograms times meters squared over second squared. Ta-da! Works out again to joules. This is a great time for an example. Let's take the noble cheetah. Uh, we'll list the relevant information, write down the blank equation, plug in our numbers, get our answer. Um, I did go ahead and skip a step. I went straight to the two sig figs in the answer, but you could certainly write down the full answer and then round it to two sig figs. So that would be about 24 kilojoules, which means nothing to you unless you go and figure out your own kinetic energy. So uh, I'll leave that to you to mark off some meters and, and figure out how fast you're going. Odds are you'll be about an order of magnitude less than the cheetah. Of course, let's uh, touch Einstein's equivalence equation here. E equals mc squared, the famous equation. Uh, mass in this is going to be in kilograms. Again, uh, c is going to be the uh, speed of light, which is a uh, velocity. Notice it's meters per second. Now, you don't necessarily have to memorize C to that many sig figs, but feel free to. The units, again, end up being kilograms times the quantity meters per second squared in joules. So think about it. Um, uh, if you were to take a one kilogram mass and convert it completely in energy, which is unlikely, but for the sake of argument, you would get one times three times 10 to the eighth squared, which would be nine times 10 to the 16th joules. Compare that to 24,000 joules, and just like the uh, cheetah dwarfs your kinetic energy, uh, the uh, energy uh, of a mass 
dwarfs the cheetah by many, many, many more orders of magnitude. And of course, when Einstein realized this, this, this led to the first steps towards atomic energy and atomic weapons, um, which again is another story. So let's hit some other terms here real quick. Heat and temperature are terms that a lot of people use incorrectly, just like mass and weight we talked about earlier. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules in a system. This is an intensive property, which means when you measure something's temperature, changing the amount doesn't change the temperature. So if you had a cup of hot cocoa and you poured half of it out, the temperature doesn't change. It's still the same temperature. Now what you have done though is, is you've hindered that cocoa's ability to keep you warm because the reason you're holding the cocoa is because of its heat content. Um, heat, and again, different people might have different definitions, but I found a good definition is the flow of energy in a system is heat from something that's warmer to something that's cooler. Um, this is an extensive property because the more of something you have, the more heat that can flow from it. That bigger cup of cocoa was going to keep you much warmer than that tiny cup of cocoa. Um, again, so think about people. People all have the same relative temperature and might vary a little bit with age, but it's all about 98.6. But again, if you were cold, you'd much rather hug Santa Claus um, than Bill Nye uh, because Santa Claus is going to have a lot more heat content to transfer towards you than Bill Nye would. Sparklers is another good example of this. Uh, sparklers have a temperature over 2,000 degrees, very, 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 very hot, um, hotter than uh, many metals, uh, the melting point of metals. Uh, but the reason why sparklers uh, are, are used uh, with, with uh, recklessness is the fact that the sparks that come off the sparkler um, have, have very little energy to transfer because it ha they have such tiny mass. Um, and so even though the temperature of those sparks are very high, uh, they don't carry much heat with them. Uh, but if you were to lay that sparkler down on somebody or something, uh, that can be extremely dangerous because we still have the same high temperature, uh, but now we have a massive amount of energy that can be transferred. Um, so you can get severe burns or you certainly light things on fire with a sparkler. So watch out. Again, if you were trying to keep warm, I'd, I'd choose a warm bath over a lit match. Unless you were planning to light something on fire, uh, you'll get much more heat out of the warm bath than you will out of the lit match. So finally, two important terms that you might not have heard before, um, but uh, you do now, and they will come up all the time in science, is the idea of exo and endothermic. Uh, they're really not that hard to tell apart, but they, you do need to take a little bit of time to differentiate them. Endothermic, think of in. Think of something going in. Like if money's going into your bank account, uh, then your bank account is absorbing money. And if energy is going into a system, then that system is absorbing energy. So in this picture, you can infer that that pot is absorbing energy from the fire. So that pot is going undergoing an endothermic change. Um, anything that feels cold to the touch is absorbing energy from you, hence endothermic. Uh, but in this case, you know, cooking whatever that is in there, soup, we're gonna refer it to soup, boiling that is gonna absorb energy. So believe it or not, that will cool the surroundings. If you don't believe me, um, think about how hot the environment would be if that pot wasn't there. Uh, the air around that fire would probably be uh, warmer because uh, all of the energy would be going to heat the surroundings as opposed to the energy going into that pot to heat the metal and heat the water and, and probably boil it. So anything that absorbs energy would be endothermic. Exothermic are things that are releasing energy. Uh, so if something uh, feels warm to you, uh, it is releasing energy into you. Exo, exo exiting. So again, if money is leaving your bank account, that's money that's going out into the world. Exothermic is energy going out into the world. So if you were to light a match on fire, uh, that, that would feel warm because the match is losing the stored energy to the environment and you're in the environment. Um, uh, freezing, on the other hand, uh, it needs to also give off energy. Uh, for something to go from a liquid, which is moving rapidly, to a solid, uh, it's got to lose energy to slow down. And so you want to put it in an environment that can absorb the energy from it, so you put it in a freezer. Again, um, a freezer that's freezing something is probably going to be warmer than a freezer that's not because energy has to uh, leave that frozen system. Um, so that gives you something to think about. 
Uh, I'll cut my conversation of endo and exothermic short there. There's plenty of other examples of it out there, but if I'm going to keep this under 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to have to call it quits. So uh, thanks for making it through all that. That was a lot to cover in one day, but I hope it taught you some stuff. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.